Hey everybody, and welcome to the Wedding Videography for Beginners YouTube channel. I'm your host, Phil Beabout, and tonight we are going to be talking to you about what is the best wedding videography equipment you should be getting in 2021. I'm really excited to talk about this because I just love talking about equipment to begin with. And I just, I wanna kind of break down what we think the best things that you should be getting in 2021 are by category. So we're gonna have three categories. You're gonna have the come up, you're gonna have, or you're gonna have broke, you're gonna have the come up, and you're gonna have baller. So those are gonna be our three our three things. Now I did jack those three categories from Kazi. Uh, if you haven't checked out his YouTube channel, he breaks down a, he's an amazing colorist. Uh, he uses DaVinci Resolve and his YouTube channel is just, he, he puts out a lot of really good information. So I'll give a little shout out to him because I'm stealing some of his terms. So what I wanna do is I wanna talk about cameras, I wanna talk about audio, we're gonna talk about lighting, we're gonna talk about some monitors, we're gonna talk about miscellaneous equipment, so we're gonna kinda of break things down by category. So you're gonna have, we're gonna talk about cameras, you're gonna talk about what you can get if you're broke, what you can get if you're on the come up, and what you can get if you're balling. Does that kinda of make sense? We're gonna do that through each one all the way through. Um, I do just wanna say on a side note, I am recording this on the Panasonic S5 in Vlog, and I am using the Zoom F2 with a COS 11D microphone right now. It's somewhere in here-ish. So um, just so you know, you know, when you're listening to the audio and that kind of stuff, that, that's actually what you're hearing. So we're not using a boom mic or anything like that. All right, let's get started. So let's look at cameras. Now, when it comes to cameras, I am a little partial to the Panasonic family, only because a Panasonic GH5S was the first camera that we got, but I would recommend if you are on the broke side that you start off with the Panasonic GH5. Now, the GH5 is just an awesome, well-rounded camera that has a ton of features in it. This is a little micro four-thirds beast. It shoots in 4K 10-bit 422 at 24p. It shoots in 4K 8-bit 420 in 60p. It's super lightweight. Um, <clears throat> it's got IBIS dual memory card slots, full-size HDMI, and no record limits. And you don't have to worry about it overheating. So we've used this at ceremonies and all kinds of stuff where we've recorded for well over an hour with it. And it's just trudged along like a little trooper. The, uh, the only thing that you gotta worry about is math, and that's because it's a micro four thirds camera, so you multiply everything by two. So right now there is a 25 millimeter lens on it, so that's a 50 millimeter full frame equivalent, and that lens is at 1.2 aperture, so that makes it a 2.4 aperture equivalent. So you just gotta do, you gotta do some math with it. But we love the GH5. You can get one of these for in between 800 to 1,000 bucks used, which I would highly recommend. Uh, the day that we're filming this, we actually sold one on eBay. Uh, we sold it and a lens for 1200 bucks. So try to check them out used. You know, you don't need to have a super big budget to get this. If you were looking at like a Canon equivalent, you know, you're kind of looking at the, um, the Canon SL3, I think would be close to this. And when I looked at that camera, it's got a 30 minute record limit. It only shoots at 4K up to 24P, then you gotta drop down to 1080P. The reason why I like shooting in 4K isn't really because I think that 4K is the end all be all and it's, you know, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. I like the flexibility in post. So I like being able to punch my image in. I like being able to reframe it if I need to without having any real loss when I put it out on a 1080P timeline. That kind of makes sense. So I, I like that, that degree of uh, forgiveness, I guess, if you will. So that's why I like this. This is a relatively inexpensive camera body that has a ton of features in it for you know everyone to use for the most part. Like there's this, this little camera, it's, it's great. So I would, I would highly recommend the GH5 if you're broke for the simple fact that it hits a ton of wickets at a really, really low price point. The only, some of the negatives about it, you hear everyone talk about 
uh, Panasonic's autofocus. And they're right, the autofocus is horrible. We'll talk about the S5 here in a second, but the autofocus is, it's bad. However, you don't really need to rely on autofocus. There's not a ton of stuff going on during a wedding to where you can't be doing manual focus. And trust me, if I can figure out how to manually focus a lens, everyone can do it. I have no background in wedding videography or videography or photography or anything like that. And it's, it's not as hard as what you would think. So don't, don't really get hung up on the whole autofocus thing. That's just my, it's my personal opinion. Uh, also, because it's micro four thirds, the depth of field is a little different. There's different uh, calculations and you, you have to be a different distance back to get full frame equivalent. But when you're shooting on like this, like an Olympus lens, you get, you get a really close, you get really close to it. So with all that being said, there are some downsides to the camera, but I love these little things. I think that they are great. One thing that I was going to talk about, actually, we'll talk about that at the lenses here in a minute. All right. So that's, that's the broke side. So if we jump up a level, you get one of those for 800 to a thousand, you bump up to this. This is the Panasonic S5. The S5 retails at 1999-ish, 1998-ish. This is the full frame mirrorless Panasonic camera. I've been shooting on this now for a few months. We got ours back in November and I, I just love the camera. I think it's great. I like Panasonic's color science, even though color isn't really a science. I mean, red is red. So anyways, the, um, I love that this is, this has IBIS dual cards, dual card slots, dual native ISO at, in V-Log, it's 640 and 4,000. It's super lightweight. You know, obviously it's got IBIS. This thing, it doesn't overheat. Uh, it is just, it is a monster of a camera and I love it, especially for the price point. That's the whole reason why this is in the come up category because the Panasonic S5 costs about, it's double what you could get a GH5 for, but you get a very, very nice camera for that price. Some downsides to it, it has a 30 minute record limit, which we're not really, we're still haven't really adjusted to. That's kind of a pain. Uh, I do like not having a record limit. That's just, it's just a nice feature. And obviously the autofocus is improved. We've done some tests on it to where some things work, some things don't. I don't know if I would really rely on the autofocus. Um, you know, just like everybody else, I think Panasonic needs to needs to give up with the contrast base. But anyways, that's beside the point. You can manually focus with these with any of these lenses. It works really well when you're manually focusing with an S5. It's telling you the distance down at the bottom of the screen. So as you start to pull start to pull focus, it's telling you where where the lens is relative to a foot line. So if it's at the four feet then that's where the lens is pulling focus would be four feet in front of the lens. Like it's actually really neat how they kind of have it broken down. So the, the last thing is this piece, the micro HDMI, you know, the GH fives have a uh, full HDMI, just a normal HDMI input like this. This has the micro HDMI, which just makes me think I'm going to break it. it. seems really delicate and I'm just not a fan of that tiny connector going in there. All right, so moving into the ball and category, <clears throat> this is probably gonna make a bunch of Canon people angry. I would say go with the Sony A7S III, uh, or A7S II. I don't have a, uh, uh, a Sony camera. However, I don't know what kind of voodoo they've been doing at Sony, but those, the cameras are phenomenal. You know, it's, those cameras start at the $3,500 price point and I mean, that's, you're getting a jump in both recording capabilities and price, but you're talking 4K, 10-bit, 422 in pretty much every shooting mode, 24, 60, 120. I mean, it's, it's amazing. The camera, the camera is really a beast and it's, it's worth the money if you can afford it. The, it's got unlimited recording time. It has IBIS. Uh, the autofocus with Sony works really well. The, it has dual cards, you know, full-size HDMI. It's, it's completely ridiculous. Uh, 
and like I said, you get what you pay for though. When you're starting to pay, you know, three, six, seven thousand dollars for a camera, you should be getting a lot of good upgrades to it. And we just personally, the thirty-five hundred dollar price point just wasn't there for us. It was more economical for us to purchase S5 cameras at $2,000 and deal with some little quirks with autofocus than it would have been to almost double that price to get, get a Sony. Um, but the Sony, the new, those Sonys are just, they're fantastic. So if you're, if you're balling on a budget, then that's, that's what I would be gunning for. Um, I do want to talk real quick about lenses. <clears throat> if, just in general terms, if you're getting a GH5, for example, the Olympus lenses, like this Olympus 25 millimeter, this, this retails for about $1,000. What I love about Olympus glass and what they've done with these lenses is when you pull the clutch back, there's a hard stop. So if you look down at the lens, it's actually telling you right here, it's at five feet infinity. It's telling you what you're focusing at. Two feet, half meter, 0.3 meters. I don't have any idea what that is in inches. But the, uh, so these, these lenses are really good, especially if you're just starting out because you can't, they don't just spin to infinity. You can just physically look down and say, oh, my subject's about five feet in front of me. So you just slide it over to five and then you can start wiggling it from that point. So something to think about when you're purchasing lenses I don't really, I didn't really break down categories for lenses because lenses should be expensive. The glass that you're using is going to really determine a lot about the quality of your image, the sharpness, the colors, the light reflection or re refraction, whatever that is, that kind of stuff. So we purchased all Olympus glass for our GH5s, our Micro Four Thirds system, that's that's all we used was Olympus. I really like Olympus lenses. I think that they're fantastic. For the S5, we purchased all Sigma. Now Sigma we did for the simple fact that they are exponentially cheaper than native glass. This is the Sigma 24 to 70 f 2.8 for an L mount, and I got this for I think it was a thousand bucks on B and H. So between the camera and the lens, you're looking at around three thousand dollars. But this twenty-four to seventy lens, if I'm solo shooting a wedding, it's the only lens I need for ninety percent of the entire day. I plop this at fifty and then stick it on my gimbal, and that's it. That's what I use for the ceremony when the speeches are going. I can drop this on 24, get audience reactions, that kind of stuff. Like this is a very, very versatile lens. And if you were only buying one, I would highly recommend that it was the 24 to 70. Now for the same exact price, the Olympus lens for micro four thirds is, you know, it's also a thousand dollars, but I'd recommend getting the 25 millimeter because the 50 millimeter lens is super versatile. You can use it for a wide range of things. 50 millimeter is a really good focal length. For the most part of a wedding day, when I was shooting by myself with that, I would just be using the 50. I wouldn't be hopping around to anything. Now for Sony, I would just recommend purchasing either Sigma glass because the connection that Sigma has between the lens and the Sony body works really well for autofocus or Sony glass. So I think the Sigma glass is a little bit cheaper and I, I, I like Sigma. I think Sigma's a, that's a good, it's a good lens. So let's, just to kind of recap with that for cameras, if you're broke, get a G8, get the GH5. If you're on the come up, get the S5. If you're balling, grab a Sony. You don't need to get the Sony Alpha 1. I think it's a little overkill for weddings right now. I think that's a crazy spec'd out camera, but I'm not going to say you need to get that at this point. That's just my personal opinion. All right. So let's talk about audio. Now, when it comes to audio, there, if you have to get one audio recorder, so we're down at that broke level, I would highly recommend getting the Zoom F2. 
Now, the Zoom F2 you hear, we did a video on it, which I'll link somewhere around here. We did, there's, there's a ton of good qualities with the Zoom F2. A lot of people have been screaming into it to kind of show what 32-bit float looks like. But for wedding videography, I think that one of the best qualities for the Zoom F2 is its noise floor. So you can go up, but you can also go down. And why I would say if you only had to buy one, if you had this, micro, this setup that I have right now on a groom, you would be able to pick up the audio from the bride or partner and the officiant. Because the noise floor is so low, you could go into it and post and pull the gain up and you're not going to be introducing that like and all that kind of stuff, that white noise sound. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get that with the Zoom. So you could actually, you should be able to get by with that one recorder and then be able to pick up all of that audio uh, without like damaging it, without creating stuff that just sounds really nasty. Now, with that being said, you could also take the recorder and then gaff tape it to the microphone stand when people are giving speeches. So that way, when they're talking into the microphone that's hooked up to the DJ soundboard, you're picking up that audio and it's just recording into the recorder itself. But a boom, you got your speeches now. So you can get by with that one microphone for your first, you know, few weddings, and you should be able, you should be okay with it. So that's what I would say to get, if you're broke and you can only get one, you get the non-Bluetooth version, it's $149.99 at B&H. It's not a crazy price point. So I, <clears throat> next, I would recommend the Tascam DR10L. We have a white one, we have a black one. Like I, I really like the Tascam microphones. These have an auto gain level into it. I think the microphones, that the microphone itself that comes with it works really well. So I would recommend if you're on the come up that you purchase a Tascam with a white lavalier mic and then you use that for the bride. So the bride's audio is being recorded separately. You have the groom's audio being recorded at the same time. And then, you know, as you start to branch out, you know, you use more. We, we, we have multiple microphones, so I would highly recommend if you're on that broke side that you start off with the Zoom F2 and you start to expand out. Now, as you start to come into the come up side, I would recommend the H6. The H6, this is, a, this is a little monster of a recorder. I love it. Most of the time when I'm doing these, I'm actually recording into the H6, but since I'm talking about all this stuff right now, I'm just, I'm using a... Uh, lav mic, but when we do our podcasts and that kind of stuff, we're recording right into the H6. So the H6 has four XLR inputs, and those XLRs actually have a quarter inch input built into it, so you can use either one. They have independent line level adjustment, and then the um, I have a battery in here. No, um, the it has a color screen on it, so you can actually read the levels and that kind of stuff as things are coming in, and you can adjust those levels. I been using this for a while. This is a great, great little machine. And this retails for $329.99 on B&H. Now, if you were going to use this, I would highly recommend that you also purchase a uh, splitter. So this is from Jack's in the Box. And we've been using the splitter now for a little over a year. And I love this thing. And the reason why this thing is so effective is you can see that it has input, output, and output. So what happens, I'll go over to the DJ. I'll tell the DJ that I'm going to pop in a splitter. I'll kind of yap to him for a second and, you know, explain to him what I'm doing. And it's not going to destroy any of his equipment. And what I do is I take the input line that he has. So whatever is coming in from his microphone, that XLR input, I plug it into here. And then I take an output here and I pop an XLR into it and I put it into my recorder and then I take another XLR, I have two, and then I put that XLR into his board where he would normally put his microphone. And what the splitter does is it takes that clean, balanced line from the microphone and hits this box and it splits it to where I get a clean balance feed, he gets a clean balance feed. So no matter what he is doing or she, 
is doing to that audio, it will never affect what's happening to mine. So he could crank the gain up, he could be pumping music into it, he could be doing all kinds of stuff coming out of their speakers, but you would never hear that because the only thing that's coming into my recorder because of the splitter is that clean balance feed directly from the microphone. So this, this thing is genius. Yeah, it's like 30 bucks and I would highly recommend getting one of these. Um, I did skip over something. If you wanted to get a recording device, you could get the H1, the H or the H1N. The H1N is a small, you know, it's like a, it's almost, it's half the size of the H6. It's got two uh, stereo, just left, right mics on it. And you can pick up one of those for a hundred bucks, they're $99.99 at B&H. The issue is it only takes a 3.5 millimeter mic line into it. So you would need to purchase an attenuator, which is a little cable that takes that, I, I always get these backwards, it's taking that line hot signal from the DJ board and converting it to a mic signal. So what happens is if you plug one of those in and you don't have that, you're, the vol it's gonna be completely blown out because it's, it's taken too hot of a signal into that little three and a half millimeter jack. So this, this is mic and line level, so it automatically converts it, so you don't need to worry about it with the H6. With the H1, you gotta, you gotta bring that down. So the, uh, you'd have to get the attenuator with it, but all together with those, that's 130 bucks. So you would have the ability to hook into a DJ soundboard uh, and then record the audio out of it if you were using an attenuator. <clears throat> now, next, if you're balling, get the Zoom F6. Now, we don't have one of those. It's an amazing piece of equipment though. I'd like to get one, but if I purchase any more equipment, I'm pretty sure that my wife would probably hit me with a shovel. So we, the Zoom F6 has six line inputs. Yep, it's got six inputs into it. It has all of the same features that this does. So it, it takes XLR or quarter, it just has six of them. You can adjust each one of those independently. There's, it's got color screens, the whole nine yards, but what really separates the F6 from everything else is the 32-bit the float. Now, when, you, when I talk about 32-bit float with the Zoom, the Zoom is limited to what the microphone can handle. So this COS 11D, I think, can get to 120 decibels. So you can get pretty loud with it, but once you go over that, it's still gonna clip because the microphone just can't handle that amount of you know gain or noise, whatever you wanna call it coming into it. The Zoom F6 though has an auto gain in it. So what it does is as it starts to get super loud, it'll bring the gain down itself to keep that within that 32-bit float range. So you can pretty much have like a jet engine next to it and it's gonna bring that down to where in post you can recover that without it clipping. It's a really, really awesome audio device uh, it costs six hundred and forty nine ninety nine, and that's that's balling. So just kind of recap audio things. If you're broke, I'd recommend either just getting the Zoom F two, or getting the H one, H one N, or both. You know they're, they're one hundred and thirty and one hundred and forty, one hundred forty nine. If you're up in the come up, I'd recommend the the H six. And it's a great recorder. It's um, three twenty nine ninety nine. And then obviously, if you're balling, I'd get the I get the F six. That that thing's a, a monster. All right, let's go into lighting. If you are in the broke category, you do not have to purchase lighting. I would highly recommend that you did, but you always have the option of not purchasing something either. So with that being said, we'll just say for lighting, if you're broke, you, you don't have lighting. When you're in the come up, I would recommend the core, I think these are SWXs or SXW. Um, the, or SW, it is SWX. The, these are the 250s. 
and we use the 250s. There's a 250 behind me. That's what's cast in the blue thing in the background. Um, I love these little lights. Now they're at the 300, so you can get the SWX 300, which is just brighter. Um, so I would, I'd highly recommend these for the come up because I, you can get, so let, let's talk about features. These take a Sony L-Series battery, bloop, and this NP970 can power this thing. I just need one for the entire day. It powers it for speeches, dances, reception, like it, it powers it for hours. So it also has a, uh, a remote, like an old school remote. I should have actually brought it out. It's, it's where you pull the antenna out. It looks like it's from the 1970s, but it works really well. And that remote can control two different lights or I think control eight different lights. But anyways, since we have two, we have it set to where it controls both of them. So I just bust out the remote. I can turn it on. These are dimmable. They're bicolor. Uh, they go from 3,200 to 5,600 Kelvin. So these, I really like these lights. They're light. They're easy to carry around. I like them. And you can get the 300s for 180 $189, $189.99. These go on sale all the time. I think I got mine in a two pack and now I see the 300s in a three pack. So I, you know, I, I love these lights. So if you're on the come up, I, this is what I would recommend. The Core SWXs. All right, so moving into the ball and light, the Aperture Lightstorm 60X is, it's not shipping yet. You can pre-order it, but that light looks fantastic. Uh, I seen a review that Matt Johnson did with it and that light just looks amazing. It's bicolor, it's dimmable. The colors go from 2700 to 6500 Kelvin. It takes L series batteries. It also can be hardline powered. Like that is an excellent light. It's a a spotlight, but it can go from 15 degrees to 45 degree uh flood. So it goes from a 15 degree spot to a 45 degree flood. It's the light looks amazing. So if you, if you're balling, I'd recommend picking those up. They retail for $419 on B and H. I'd really like to pick up two of them and replace these. But again, I'm on a spending moratorium for the rest of 2021. So I'm very sad about that. Uh, but if if I was balling, the apertures would be the way to go. And I, I know you, people talk about the Practolite and that kind of stuff, but the aperture is like half the price of the Practolite and it actually looks like it, it outperforms it. So I'd highly recommend that. So just to kind of recap, if you're on the broke side, you don't necessarily have to have lights. I would just highly recommend that you get them because the lights really enhance the look of the dances, the look of the speeches, that kind of stuff. So I'd highly recommend lights. But if you're broke, you can kind of work around it for right now. If you're on the come up, I'd recommend the core SWXs. And then if you're balling, I'd recommend that you get the aperture. Those, those things are bad. All right, so let's talk about monitors. And I, I didn't realize how much I liked a monitor until I started using one and I got spoiled with it. So you got different sizes, you have different companies and that kind of stuff. And I'm gonna talk about the ones that we have because we actually have the five and a half inch Andy Cine, which it's, this monitor's good. Like the new the new Andy Cine five and a half inch is touch screen, this one isn't. Uh, it's touch screen, it has, it can take LUTs. Like it's, it's a good little monitor. And when you're looking at the back of the LCD screen, the uh, the size of the monitor is really, it's really beneficial. It really helps you get things framed. There's waveforms built into these. You have false colors. You have focus peaking. There's a lot of different um, tools that are built right into this monitor that can really help you take a better image. Like right now, there's focus peaking on the monitor behind me. You know, we're using the waveform on it. Like it's it's really beneficial. So I'd I'd recommend a monitor. You don't have to get one. The five and a half inch touch, touch screen goes for $189. Uh, we 
hardly use this one anymore just because we have the seven inch touch screen. So if you're on the come up, I'd recommend these. I love this monitor. I didn't realize how much of a difference seven inches would make over five. That just sounds really... <laughs> so if you've made it this far in the video, this is, it's getting pretty good. Uh, I love this monitor. This, it's touch screen. You can put LUTs into it. Uh, the buttons on the top are programmable, just like the ones over here. So you, you have three programmable function buttons. So if you wanna, like uh, F3 for us is waveform, F2 is focus peaking, and F1 is false colors. So that, that gives us, you know, a good, gives us a lot of tools right at our fingertips to really help get the image where we want it. Uh, what I really like about these, and you can see it with the five inch is, you can take power from the monitor and push it to the camera. So we have a dummy battery in our GH5 that's fed up to the monitor. So if we had one, else, one um, MP970 battery plugged into this thing, this will go for like three hours. It'll power the camera, the monitor, the whole, the whole thing. Like it, it'll, it'll do everything in this little, this little package. So I love that feature with that. The, we do not have any dummy batteries for the S5. So we're obviously using the S5 batteries in it. Uh, so yeah, no, I mean, that's, I think that's just an amazing, an amazing feature. Now, if you were balling, I'd recommend getting the small HD focus series. They're way more expensive than these two, but there are some better features in the small HD focus monitors. The user interface, the UI, is a lot better. It's a lot more fluid. It kind of makes more sense. This is really clunky. But once you have everything set with these, you don't really need to go back to it. That's just my, I rarely go into the menus anymore. But the small HD, you can actually set up cards and you can just swipe. So you can have them kind of in order and you can just swipe over to like false colors and that kind of stuff. Like, so that's, it's got a really cool interface, but you jump from 269 for the seven inch feel world to 899 for the seven inch small HD focus. So there is a considerable jump in price. Personally, I don't know if that much of a difference in price justifies the features with it. I've been shooting with this now for a little while and I love these things. There's one on the camera at the S5 that I'm talking into right now. Like it's, they're just, they're, they're great. They're great monitors. So this is 269. I think I actually got ours on sale at B&H for less than that, like 250 or 225, something like that. So <clears throat> I, uh, I, I like these monitors, if you can't tell. So like I said though, you don't have to get a monitor. With the S5, the LCD screen's not that great, but we already had monitors. So I didn't have to go out and purchase something extra when we bought the S5. I do think that having a monitor though really helps when it comes to your composition and that kind of stuff because it's significantly larger. So, but if you're broke, don't get a monitor use what you got on your camera for right now, you know, build up profit, that kind of stuff, and then build into it eventually. If you're on the come up, I'd recommend getting the Feel World 7-inch touch monitor. I think it's great. And if you're balling, grab a small HD focus. All right, so there's, there's a few things that I want to talk about with just miscellaneous categories right now. The first being SD cards. We shoot, right now this video is shooting at 4K 24 10-bit 422 internal on the S5, and we're using all the same cards. So this is, we're shooting on SanDisk Extreme Pro. This is a 95 megabit a second, 128 gig card. So this will get you about two, two hours recording time on the card. Uh, and these retail for like 50 bucks on B&H. I see a lot of people who talk about like you need U3 and V90 and a bunch of stuff, and we never have. And what I, how I understand it is the mega, 
bytes or megabits, I'm probably saying that wrong, the megabytes per second that your camera is shooting at. Like if you're going into an S5 or a GH5's menu and you're saying, I wanna shoot at 4K, blah, 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 blah. It's telling you it's at 150 megabytes per second. I probably have that backwards. Uh, so what you need to do is convert that to megabits because that's what the cards are. And in order to do that, you just gotta divide it by eight. So if you take that number and you divide it by eight and it's smaller than the number on the card, like this 95 megabits per second, then the card's gonna work. So don't think that you have to spend $1,000 on this super high speed card. Just look at what your camera actually needs and then buy a card off that. We have the 256 gig cards in the S5s because we, two of those I think will get you eight hours, which is way more than what we need. Uh, but we spent a hundred bucks on those each. So it's not, like don't, don't think that you need to buy something crazy. Understand what your camera needs and then purchase something for it. And the SanDisk Extreme Pros, and then I think there was one other type that we had. It's the, those are the, the black ones and then the gold ones, the just SanDisk Extremes. These are 150 megabits per second. Um, those are the only two types of cards that we have and they, they work perfect. We've never had an issue with any one of these cards. Uh, the only shooting mode that you can't shoot in with those cards is all I on like the GH5, the GH5S, because that's at 400 and that you do need a bump at that point. But we shoot in long GOP with all of them and it they work just great. When when it comes to tripods and miscellaneous stuff like that, I look at more economical things than I do name brand things. While you can go out and get a Manfrotto tripod, those cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars, upwards of like a grand for a tripod. To me, a tripod's a tripod. As long as it can hold the weight of the camera, that's all I really care about. And we, we have the newer, newer, I don't, still don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, we bought them off Amazon. They're, they're really cheap, but they're, they work really well. We have a carbon fiber one. We have a regular one. Uh, the only thing that we bought that was a brand was the, the Surrey Monopod. And I think we have the 424, which is, um, uh, I specifically bought that because that monopod can hold the gimbal, the camera, and the seven inch monitor, and I can just set it up and leave it. So what I do is I take the base plate off of the gimbal and I just drop that into the head of the monopod with the legs obviously deployed, and then I just leave it that during the ceremony. I can just set that down and just let it go. So I, I wanted to get a monopod that could hold the weight of the, the stuff that I was using. So, and that, that cost like 300 bucks. I think I got, actually, no, I think I got it used on eBay. So keep an eye out for deals and that kind of stuff. Like, don't be afraid to buy things used. We, I pick up used lenses. I pick up used camera bodies. Like we, yeah. So now when it comes to batteries, you've heard me talk a lot about the L series batteries and what, if you've noticed, we have created an ecosystem that uses the same battery type. So our monitors use L-series batteries, our lights use L-series batteries. I mean, these lights that you can't see, these lights use L-series batteries. We've created an ecosystem that all operates off of one type of battery. And we did that because it's just easier. You don't have to keep track of a million different things. Now, we've been buying the DSTE batteries. And these work really well. We've never had an issue with one of these. So I would highly recommend purchasing the uh, like third-party DSTE batteries. And then when it came to the GH5, GH5S, we were getting the Power Extra and the Wasabi Power batteries. And we never had any problems with either one of these. So we have a bunch. I have like 20 of these batteries. You can pick up two packs of the GH5 type batteries for like 20 bucks now. And I think these, I think a two pack of these is 40. I didn't look, but they're, they're not super expensive. So 
We stopped using rechargeable batteries, not because we hate the environment, it's just because they don't last very long and we just popped them in the kids' toys. We use regular, like what the Zoom is in right now, it's just a regular AAA battery that, that we purchased. So nothing crazy with that. Um, I mean, that, that kind of wraps everything up in general. You know, we talked about cameras, we talked about lenses, we talked about audio equipment, we talked monitors, we talked lighting, we touched on some miscellaneous things. Um, you probably noticed that all of my cameras are in cages, so we're, we're using the small rig cages. The reason why we're using cages is I'm horrified that if I drop one, I damage it. So I, I wrap them up, that way I don't have to worry about anything. It's great. So, well, I mean, you still have to worry, I mean, I don't walk around carefree with it, but the, uh, I like having a little security. Plus I don't like having like this weight from the monitor, the battery, that kind of stuff, pulling on the hot shoe mount, because I'm terrified that the, the hot shoe mount's gonna rip out. So it's, I think it's better like that. So those are kind, those are our, recommendations for 2021. I think 2021 is going to be significantly different than 2020, obviously. You know, there's a ton of stuff going on in the, it just four weddings right now. I know we're getting inquiries you know, on a daily basis, which is great, but we also can't shoot that many. And one thing that I try to stress to people is in New England, there's like 30 to 50,000 weddings every summer out here, and there's not that many vendors. So it's definitely, I'm a firm believer in community over competition just for the simple fact that there's no physical way for all of us to be competing for these weddings. There's just plenty to go around. So I would, I'd highly recommend that you guys, if you can do the come up, that's where I would stick. And I just say that because that's pretty much where we stick. And the reason is, is while we could go out and get Sony cameras and you know, aperture lights and that kind of stuff. It's just not, you always got to think in the back of your head, what's the return on investment? Are you going to be raising the price of your wedding enough to cover the cost of all that new equipment? So just kind of keep that, think, think about that in the back of your head when you're, when you're evaluating things and um, when, you're, when you're making, you know, those kind of purchases. Like, can I make a return on what I'm purchasing? All right. With that being said, thank you so much for walking. Walking. Thank you so much for watching. Um, yeah, if you like this, if you liked what we talked about, you know, please like and subscribe to us on YouTube. If you're listening to this on the podcast, you know, make sure that you subscribe. If you have any questions, you can shoot us an email at hello at weddingvideographyforbeginners.com. Uh, you can reach out to us at our private Facebook group, which is Wedding Videography for Beginners. You know, feel free to touch base. If you have questions, leave a comment, you know, shoot us an email. We're more than happy to help. So I hope everybody's staying safe and we will talk to you here in a little bit. All right, bye. I still don't know what to say at the end of these things. I gotta, I gotta figure that out one of these days. Gotta make a, gotta make an outro.